Mason Schultz, Director of Education at Stockholm Resilience Center. So I've been asked to give you an updated science-based diagnosis of the situation and also to reflect on how companies and investors can contribute to building a resilient future. A future where all people can meet their needs within the capacity of the planet and where we can thrive through changes, large and small. And just like last year, I'll start by reminding you of where this conference actually takes place in the biosphere and a biosphere that is under Holocene-like conditions. So with a fairly stable climate that we've had for 10,000 years. And this is still the only place in the whole universe where we know that humans can live. A 20 kilometer thin layer around planet Earth where we appeared only a couple of hundred thousands of years ago. And as you know, the human population reached one billion in 1800. It took us 130 years to reach two billion. And now today, we're eight billion people in the biosphere. The latest figures from the UN World Population Prospect indicate that we will stabilize just above 10 billion people towards the end of this century. And this is because when women get access to education, job, and family planning, and we, when we know that our children will survive, then the population actually stabilizes. So that is really our mission here, to help meet the needs of 10 billion people in the biosphere. I will also remind you that for this to happen, the three dimensions of people, planet and profit need to be addressed not as pillars where one is balanced against the other, but as the intertwined dimensions of sustainable development that they truly are. We all depend on each other and on the other life on this planet to survive and to thrive. And this goes for companies as well as communities, for cities as well as investors. So our economy is embedded in society and society in turn is embedded in the biosphere. I think we've all seen in the past year how quickly our democratic, peaceful societies can destabilize, how easily climate action can be framed to divide and to polarize. And we all know how important our democratic institutions are for collective action. And recent empirical research shows that democracies generate better climate policy outputs. So I also need to remind you that so far, much of our economic development has happened at the expense of future generations and of people elsewhere. And we continue to see signs that the capacity of the biosphere to support our future is weakening. At the same time, as growing inequalities and mistrust makes collective action difficult. So just during this year, We've seen extreme fires in eastern Canada, extreme heat in North America, Europe and China, and severe flooding in Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo, hitting vulnerable communities the hardest, but affecting us all in the end. So consequently, acting on climate and biodiversity is not really about the planet, but about us. Last year's report from the IPCC stated that the cumulative scientific evidence is unequivocal, that climate change is a threat to human well-being and the health of the planet. Also, that any further delay in global concerted action will miss a brief and rapidly closing window to secure a livable future. And I read it out because these are so strong words to come from a scientific community. 
And last week, there was a first global stock take published by the UN that really stated that we're not on track. Emissions of heat trapping gases keep increasing when in fact they should have peaked by now and they need to start decreasing to be cut by 43% in the next seven years compared to 2019 levels and 60% by 2035. Another report, the Sustainable Development Report, was released in June and showed that halfway to 2030, the SDGs are also seriously off track. Again, with the poor and vulnerable communities suffering the most. So goals related to hunger, sustainable diets and health outcomes are particularly off track, as well as goals related to terrestrial and marine biodiversity, air and plastic pollution, and the goal on strong institutions and peaceful societies. So in other words, in spite of the impressive growth that we have seen in impact investments and entrepreneurship, we still have a long way to go before we can say that we're building a resilient future. So the good news is that the biosphere keeps helping us. And here you see both the amounts of carbon dioxide that we add to the atmosphere from different sources and where those emissions go. So since 1850, more than half of our emissions have been absorbed by the ocean and by green plants on land. And nature-based solutions are gaining traction. And there's still a lot of life on this planet that we can start collaborating with. But of course, as warming continues, together with the other pressures that we put on these living systems, this capacity decreases. And the third version of the planetary boundaries is about to be uh, released with all the details about how far away we are from a safe operating space for humanity. But we can say already now that it's not looking good. As you see here, the pressures are not only from greenhouse gas emissions causing climate change and ocean acidification, but also from pollution leakage of nutrients from agriculture and destructive land use, including deforestation. And what's important to remember here is, of course, that these plant boundaries interact. So the carbon dioxide causes both climate change and ocean acidification. Both the global warming and the ocean acidification contributes to biodiversity loss, which in turn makes it more difficult to combat climate change. And on top of this, the novel entities, the, the pollution that we see, and also the nutrient leakage from agriculture into coasts make biodiversity loss even bigger. But this also means that the solutions are interconnected, that there are ways of addressing multiple planetary boundaries at the same time while contributing to human well-being. And we actually do know what it takes to meet the needs of all within the planetary boundaries. The calls for transformation are now everywhere, and the financial sector, of course, has a key role to play in making that happen. According to the global stock take report that I mentioned, we need to scale up renewable energy, phase out all unabated fossil fuels, and end the destruction of forests, make food systems sustainable, Reduce, reduce methane emissions. And these three shifts that I show here still hold as key priorities. And I would like to spend my final minutes now on that last point, the need to regenerate nature and society. Because as you know, there has been a really inspiring momentum growing in the private sector as illustrated, for example, in the growth of companies uh, that set science-based targets. This is driven by the business case of taking climate action. And the first science-based targets for nature have also been released since we met last year. It will be really exciting to follow how this de development uh, continues and also the opportunities that come with this growing group of companies that set these targets. But I think 
that we really need to be even bolder and think more about the larger systems that our companies and our investments are part of. So the need for regeneration of ecosystems and societies require that you assess the real impacts on them from your business and your investment from a holistic perspective. So you need to understand both the negative side effects and the positive ones. Exactly how you do this will differ from sector to sector. But in essence, it's about asking yourselves, if this company or investment succeeds, what will be the impacts on climate, freshwater, land, ocean, and pollution? Also, how will it affect consumer habits, social norms, and democracy? What will be the impacts on people's well-being and livelihoods? And based on this understanding, I think you can make informed decisions about where to invest your money and your time, but also develop a story that is both rationally convincing and emotionally appealing to people. In addition, we know that real transformation requires more than technological innovation. We need politicians to make sure that costs to society are priced in, so that innovations that do good for people and planet also become the most profitable ones. So ask yourself also, what regulatory shifts are needed for your solution to scale at the pace needed? Would you benefit from a carbon tax or other ways of price pricing in the externalities, like payments for ecosystem services or bans of harm harmful substances? If so, what can you do to support such shifts in policy? You know, the lobbying from those that benefit from business as usual is really strong. So this policy support from those who build sustainable alternatives need to be even stronger. I also want to end on the fact that we have seen great advancements in policy since we last met. With the European Green Deal coming into implementation, the Inflation Reduction Act rolling out, and a global landmark agreement reached on biodiversity, the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. But we need more from policymakers, and policymakers need help from all of us to put policy in place that allows you to build a resilient future for all. Thank you. <laughs>